But wait, I thought the opposition protesters were just peaceful activists who wanted a chance to join the European Union. Well, yeah, that's the official narrative that the U.S. media outlets are peddling. But the real story is far more ominous. It turns out that the most powerful and influential contingent in the opposition is a coalition of literal fascists and neo-Nazis. And they aren't peaceful. In fact, they're extremely brutal. The most prominent among these extremist groups is an organization called Svoboda. The Svoboda party, which traces its roots to the Ukrainian partisan party of World War II, was loosely allied with Nazi Germany. Until 2004, Svoboda had been called the Social Nationalist Party, a deliberate reference to the National Socialism of the Nazis. And we're not throwing the term neo-Nazi around here as an empty slur. The leader of Svoboda, Oli Tanibok, has openly targeted Jews and ethnic Russians in Ukraine for many years. In 2004, he was kicked out of Viktor Yushchenko's government for a speech calling for Ukrainians to fight against a, quote, Muscovite Jewish Mafia. And in 2005, he signed his name to an open letter to the leadership of Ukraine entitled, Stop the Criminal Activities of Organized Jewry. And none of this was a secret. The BBC was already reporting on the danger that Svoboda's rise posed back in 2012. And the EU passed a resolution that same year condemning Svoboda as, quote, racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic. Yet somehow the U.S. government thought it was appropriate to back these extremists. This is a picture of Victoria Newland from the U.S. State Department meeting with Ole Tanibok in February. And this is a picture of Senator John McCain sharing a stage with Tanibok in December. But why would the U.S. government work with neo-Nazis? Because they thought that they could control the situation. They thought that they could install their puppets behind the scenes and manipulate the situation in their favor. But they were wrong. Svoboda and the right sector are not toys to be played with. These groups are armed, they're forceful, and they view this crisis as an opportunity to reshape Ukraine in their own image. Hi there, I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Continuing the show right here, this is part two on our special on the Ukraine and the story that's not being told. And the miscalculation that the West made on pushing this issue. You know, they get their, their little fingers involved in everything when they should be backing off and doing what's called diplomacy. Oh, no, we can't have that because, you know, that doesn't make anybody money. Ah, no, no. Diplomacy doesn't sell bullets. And, of course, that's what we're interested in. And now we've got Harper and Baird going over there. So you saw, ah. the, so you saw in the previous clip a little background on who's in charge in Kiev. Uh-huh. But the international players are starting to step in. They're starting to talk about sanctions. That's right. It's going to be more escalation on sanctions. However, all the allies are not all lining up their ducks in a row. Mm -hmm. Check out what's going on between the U.S.'s rhetoric and what's going on with the rest of the EU. As Russia weighs up its next move, so too does the West. The U.S. has already suspended military operations and says it could take aim at Russia's state-run financial institutions. The U.K., though, appears to be taking a more cautious approach. Addressing the House of Commons on his return from Kiev, British Foreign Secretary William Hague avoided threatening any trade sanctions against Russia, a strategic move given the UK and the EU may not be able to afford it. Trade between Russia and the US is worth around $42 billion a year, and US exports to Russia are worth around $1 billion annually. But compared to the US, trade between the EU and Russia is far more significant. It's worth around $460 billion a year. A lot of that comes from Russia's gas, with the EU importing around 35% of its gas from Russia, earning the Kremlin almost $100 million a day. But conversely, the European Union is Russia's biggest investor, making up 75% of direct foreign investment. So while Russia may have its hand on the gas tap, it may prove too costly to turn off. The UK's willingness to impose economic sanctions has been further called into question after a secret government document was reportedly photographed as it was carried into Downing Street. The document said Britain should not impose trade sanctions nor should it close London's financial centre, but rather that it should look to joining other EU members in considering travel bans and visa restrictions. The UK says the leaked document should not be seen as a guide to British policy, insisting all options for its response to Russia remain on the table. But those options could be driven by purse strings rather than politicians, with the markets ultimately in control. Kim Vanell, Al Jazeera, London. Our first and immediate priority was to bring financial resources into the country. And it's pretty obvious where those resources are coming from. Let me just say we're on track. The IMF mission is uh, in Kyiv. 
I'm not supporting the idea of sending billions of euros at this point because we might never see this money again. They just want to get rid of the problems by giving money, like it's going to resolve them. I think this issue is more political than economic. EU taxpayers are angry. They're well aware they're the ones who'll be footing the bill. And for a country that's not even a member of the European Union, the promised economic aid will come through the International Monetary Fund. Today, the European Commission has identified a package of support to Ukraine. This is our contribution to tomorrow's meetings of heads of state and government. But what he is forgetting to mention is that the IMF provides loans under the strictest of conditions. The austerity imposed on countries like Greece and Portugal saw thousands of public sector workers laid off, benefits and pensions slashed, and taxes go up. But all of this failed to put the country's finances back on track. Despite predictions of growth, the economy plummeted even further. Many fear, far from saving Ukraine, Kiev may end up in a painful debt crisis, as has happened in several EU countries. Paul Oslia, RT. Okay, this is where we take a big step back and we tell you to start doing your research on the poverty created by the IMF. Yeah, you know, Yanukovych had a deal in back in uh, December yeah. to um, with Russia so they wouldn't have to take an IMF deal and all that goes along with that. Now, if you don't know about the IMF, this is an imaginary monetary fund. It's money that's made up out of bank promises. And it's an extraordinary cost to the people. Any country that's gotten an IMF loan has been devolved, uh, has been sent into abject poverty. Apparently, they're going to have to cut the pensions of people in the Ukraine in half. And that, of course, works out so well for the bankers who made up the IMF loan from nowhere. Of course, now that Yatsenyuk is in charge, he's going to the IMF to negotiate a new loan, but he's not telling you what that entails for the Ukrainian people. Check out what Pepe Escobar of the Asia Times has to say about it. The 15 billion, the, the promised 10 billion euro uh, rescue package for Ukraine. It's going to be indebted slavery for the foreseeable future for Ukrainians who think they're going to get a EU passport tomorrow and get great jobs like a Polish plumbers and Romanian cocktail waitresses in Paris. This is not going to happen. In Eastern Ukraine, because they are industrially linked to, to Russia, they know what this means in terms of uh, the plunder, the conditions and the takeover by central bankers of Ukraine in terms of destroying Ukrainian industry. Very important. Why Yanukovych, with all his faults, yes, why he didn't sign the EU agreement in the first place? Two reasons. Number one, he knew that it would destroy Ukrainian industry. And number two, there was a provision that Ukraine would have to respect NATO military protocol. We're going to be covering more about debt slavery and indentured servitude as we talk more about the way that governments handle banks or banks handle governments and the fact that they make money up from nowhere. But of course the U.S. and the EU are trying to impose sanctions on Russia, mm -hmm. but they may have miscalculated the uh, blowback that may occur. <laughs> I wonder who owns the paper on all that Fed debt. Russia and China have something to say. Check it out. On Tuesday, Reuters reported that a Kremlin aide, Sergei Glazyev, had announced that if the U.S. were to impose sanctions on Russia, Moscow may drop the dollar as a reserve currency and refuse to pay off any loans to U.S. banks, saying that Moscow could recommend that all holders of U.S. Treasury sell them if Washington freezes the U.S. accounts of Russian businesses and individuals. Glazyev said, quote, we would find a way not just to reduce our dependency on the United States to zero, but to emerge from those sanctions with great benefits for ourselves. An attempt to announce sanctions would end in a crash for the financial system of the United States, which would cause the end of the domination of the U.S. in the global financial system. That statement is startling by itself, but the true gravity of the situation is only evident when you consider it in context. China has taken Russia's side in the Ukraine conflict. They are, after all, allies, and China holds the lion's share of U.S. Treasuries. If Russia puts out the call to drop the dollar, China would have a choice. Either hold on to those Treasuries while the dollar slides, losing their shirts in the process, or join Russia and dump their holdings as well. It should be pretty obvious 
which way China would go. The effects of a coordinated bond sell-off by China and Russia would be earth-shattering. This would be the financial equivalent of a nuclear bomb being dropped. It is no exaggeration to say that such a move would mark the end of an era. Now you would think that this would prompt some serious reflection and that diplomats would be scrambling to resolve this peacefully. But instead, Obama signed a sanction order anyway and revoked the visas of a number of Russian officials. So there you have it. From debt slavery to Russian or, or to foreign interventionism to the possibility of a complete destabilization, destabilization of the world ec economic platform. If you think 2008 was interesting, the dominoes that are falling surrounding the Fed, surrounding the Pentagon and surrounding this whole world order thing, they're starting to fall. You have to ask yourself, who benefits from all this instability? Yeah, okay. And start following the money all the way up to the bank where it's made up from nowhere. And I guess that's the root of something. I'm Darren Howard. And I'm Robert Nisbet. Thank you for staying tuned to this look at the world's look at the Ukraine and something that lamestream media is not doing. We have documentaries coming up called Freeloaders. And Warriors and Thieves about the debacle in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this Sunday, we're going to be recording in downtown Kelowna starting at noon, talking about the debacle of $48 million budget for the RCMP headquarters being set up at Richter and Clement. This is Video Radio. Thanks for tuning in. Putin was at an event for the Paralympic Games and thanked organizers for not letting what he called problematic events get in the way. He insisted Russia was not the instigator. Putin never mentioned Crimea by name, referring only to the difficult circumstances that everyone is aware of. Later in the day, Putin did mention Crimea by name. Speaking at a Russian Security Council meeting held in Sochi, he called the situation primarily an internal crisis for Ukraine. It has emerged, he says, I want to point out, not through any fault of ours. Now, meantime, Russian military exercises are being conducted in regions along the border with Ukraine. These are images from a Russian broadcaster, operations that will apparently last until the end of the month. The situation brought strong condemnation from Western leaders again today. The German Chancellor warning Putin that if Crimea is annexed by Russia, the act would be seen as a threat to its neighbors. Russia would face massive damage, she says, politically and economically. In the U.S., the Secretary of State today said there is already a list of Russian officials who would face travel bans and have their assets frozen if the vote goes ahead. Now, assets are an issue in Crimea as well, where there are lineups at banks. People are afraid the bank will collapse, this woman says, and no one wants to lose their money. The tens of thousands of anti-war demonstrators who took to the streets to show their opposition to Putin's move on Crimea, from students to the elderly, all shared one human emotion, fear of what lies ahead. They don't know where their president is leading their country, and Russia's involvement in Crimea and Ukraine frightens them. The banners and slogans sent a message to the highest levels of government. Our enemy is not in the Ukraine, it's in the Kremlin, one read. Protesters chanting, Putin is a thief. Diplomacy appears to have run its course, and this is the last chance for these anti-war protesters to get their message across. What they're saying is that any adventures in Crimea carried out by uh, President Putin and the Kremlin would leave Russia dangerously isolated in the international community. But they're in a minority, more than 60 percent, perhaps even higher than that, of people in Russia support President Putin's moves on Crimea. Alexei, it's nearly a month now since Yanukovych was pushed out of power. What are people in Kiev saying about the new leadership? Tatiana Mantian, she was very close to the Maidan movement. She is, in fact, one of the members of the council of the Maidan. Let's listen to what she says about the new authorities in Kiev. People see it as one gang was replaced by another. These people are not capable of running anything. They were not in opposition because they were better than those people they ousted. They are far worse in governing things. And when it comes to stealing money, they're just as good. We need total elections in all spheres, from local administrations to president. Only then we can reboot the power.